Hello and welcome to my channel, Statistics from A to Z, Confusing Concepts Clarified. These videos are based on content from my book of the same name, published by Wiley. For more information on the book and these videos, you can visit my website, statisticsfromatoz.com. Hypothesis testing can be confusing for many people. Someone once said that hypothesis testing is the reason why statistics is called sadistics. That's why the book and these videos devote a good amount of time to the subject. In addition to this video, there are four additional videos and four separate articles in the book devoted to these concepts which are a part of hypothesis testing. These four videos can or will be found on the YouTube channel. The website has up-to-date and detailed information about completed and planned videos and the concepts that they cover. As usual in the book and in these videos, we'll start out with a list of keys to understanding, or KTUs, so that you can see on one page the most important things to understand about the concept. There are five keys to understanding for the concept of hypothesis testing. Let's go through the list fairly quickly and then follow that with a detailed explanation of each key. Key to understanding number one is, hypothesis testing is one method of inferential statistics that is for answering a question about a population or process based on analysis of data from a sample. The second KTU is, the question usually asks whether there is a statistically significant difference, change, or effect. The question is converted to a negative statement called a null hypothesis, symbol H sub zero. The third key to understanding is, there are two possible outcomes from a hypothesis test. Either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. The fourth KTU is, the hypothesis testing method can be performed in five steps. The fifth key to understanding is, for some types of tests, you can use the confidence intervals method instead of hypothesis testing. And here on one page is the complete list of keys to understanding the concept of hypothesis testing. You may want to pause the video here and read them all together. Let's begin our detailed explanation of each key to understanding. KTU number one states hypothesis testing is one method of inferential statistics. To understand what that is, it may help to understand what its opposite is, descriptive statistics. In descriptive statistics, we have all the data about the population or process we wish to study. For example, the human resources department of a small company has complete data on all its employees. If they want to know the mean age or the standard deviation of earnings, they can calculate those properties directly. But in many situations, the population or process is too big or it is always changing, so we can't do that. Instead, we take a sample of data and we calculate a value for a property of the sample, say the sample mean. And we use that to infer or estimate the corresponding property in the population or process, which would be the population or process mean. But we usually also want to know how good is this estimate, how much confidence we can have in its accuracy. So we use an accepted method for inferential statistics, usually hypothesis testing or confidence intervals. The question we are asking can usually, usually be stated as, is there a difference, change, or effect? And statistically significant is implied. The hypothesis will tell us whether any observed difference, change, or effect is statistically significant. The question is about a numerical statistical property, such as the mean or the standard deviation. For example, is there a difference between the means of these two populations? Or has there been a change in the standard deviation of our process from its historical value? These are everyday, easily understandable questions. But since this is statistics, we can't have everyday or easily understandable. In statistics, it seems, simple things need to be made complicated and confusing. So we first need to convert the plain English question into a negative statement 
called the Null Hypothesis. If you follow our advice of first stating a plain English question, asking whether there is a statistically significant difference, change, or effect, it is fairly straightforward to come up with a null hypothesis. You can avoid unnecessary confusion that way. For example, the question, is there a difference, becomes the null hypothesis, there is no difference. The question, has there been a change, becomes the null hypothesis, there has been no change. The question, does this treatment have an effect, becomes the null hypothesis, this treatment does not have an effect. After we conduct the hypothesis test, as described in the next KTU, we come to a conclusion about the null hypothesis. We either reject it or we don't. But instead of saying that we don't, the language of hypothesis testing says that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This language can be confusing for many people, so there are two separate articles in the book and two separate videos devoted to these two conclusions. But it all boils down to this. Reject means yes, there is a statistically significant difference, change, or effect. Failed to reject means the opposite. No, there is not a statistically significant difference, change, or effect. Note that the null hypothesis and fail to reject the null hypothesis say the same thing. There are five steps in our method for hypothesis testing. We'll cover each of these steps in turn. Step one is to state the problem or question in the form of a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. We just covered how to state a null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis can be stated as the opposite of the null hypothesis. That is, there is a difference, change, or effect. It should be noted that some experts disagree with defining the alternative hypothesis as the opposite of the null hypothesis. And some experts disagree that an alter alternative hypothesis should be used at all. These issues will be discussed in the video on alternative hypothesis. We'll also show how the alternative hypothesis can be especially useful in one-tailed tests. Step two of the five-step method is to select a value for alpha. Alpha will also be covered in a separate video, but briefly, the person performing the test selects a value for alpha. Alpha is the maximum probability of an alpha error, which they are willing to accept and still call the results statistically significant. An alpha error is more easily understandable as a false positive. It is the error of concluding that there is a difference change or effect when in reality there is not. An alpha error occurs when our sample is not representative of the population or process as a whole. Note that we wait to collect a sample of data until after we have both stated an null hypothesis and selected the value for the level of significance. So step number three is to collect a sample of data. We waited until now in order to protect the integrity of the test. We wouldn't want to peek at the data to influence either our framing of the null hypothesis or our choice for a value of alpha. In step four, the statistical test is performed. The inputs include our selection of the value for alpha, the data, and whether the test is two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed. This is explained in the video on alternative hypothesis. The output includes a value for p, the p-value. p is the actual probability of an alpha error calculated from the sample data. There is also a separate video on p. In the fifth and final step, we come to a conclusion about the null hypothesis by comparing p to alpha. If p is less than or equal to alpha, then the probability of an alpha error, a false positive, is less than or equal to the maximum value for p, which we said we would accept, and still call the difference change or effect statistically significant. So we conclude that there is a statistically significant difference change or effect and thus we reject the null hypothesis. Remember the null hypothesis said there was no difference, change, or effect. 
Otherwise, if P is greater than alpha, the probability of an alpha error is greater than what we said we would accept. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That is, we conclude there is not a statistically significant difference, change, or effect. Now, instead of comparing P and alpha, we could compare the test statistic value and the critical value. The two comparisons are statistically equivalent. This is explained in the two videos on the two possible conclusions from a hypothesis test. Reject the null hypothesis and fail to reject the null hypothesis. And here one more time is the full five-step method. Pause the video if you would like to read through them one more time. Some people don't, don't like using hypothesis testing because they find the language confusing. For example, to state a null hypothesis, one must take the question we are trying to answer and convert it to a negative statement. And one of the two possible results of a hypothesis test is fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now that's a triple negative, which is very confusing. Also, if we fail to reject, what do we do? Can we just accept the null hypothesis? Many experts say no, so that result can appear to be inconclusive. Other experts say yes, you can accept the null hypothesis. On the subject of alternative hypothesis, some experts include it in their method of hypothesis testing. Others are strongly opposed to its use. For these reasons, many people prefer to use the confidence intervals method instead of the hypothesis testing method. Hypothesis testing is one of two main methods of inferential statistics, that is for statistical analyses using samples. Confidence intervals is the other. Confidence intervals works best when we are dealing with one population and one sample of data, as in the one sample t-test. Then we are comparing a statistic we specify, for example, a target value for the mean, with the, stati the statistic calculated from the sample. However, there is disagreement among experts when dealing with two or more populations and samples, as in the two-sample t-test or the f-test. If the confidence intervals calculated from the two samples do not overlap, then the conclusion is clear. There is a statistically significant difference between the two populations. However, experts dis disagree when there is an overlap. Some say that an overlap means that there is not a statistically significant difference. Others say there can be a difference even with a small overlap. To avoid this issue, it may be advisable to stick with hypothesis testing for analyses involving two samples. Okay, that's it for our clarification of this confusing concept. If you liked this video, please remember to press the thumbs up like button on your screen below. I'll be making more videos of some or most of the 60 plus concepts in the book if folks like you tell me more videos are wanted. Please subscribe to this channel to be notified when new videos are uploaded. Also, the website statisticfromazee.com has a listing of available and planned videos. I'd also recommend following my blog at statisticsfromazee.com slash blog. I've got a statistics tip of the week series as well as posts showing you are not alone if you're confused by statistics. I'll also be posting on Facebook and Twitter. Now videos like this one can be very helpful, but they're not very handy when you want to quickly look up something on the job while studying or during an open book exam. For that, nothing beats a book or an ebook. You can also learn more about those on the website. Till next time, I'm looking forward to hearing from you.